Hello and welcome to Baijus Exam Prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you can hear me and can see me properly. If you can just confirm this in the chat very quickly, we will begin today's session of the Hindu news super analysis. Good morning everyone, those who have joined in and I have been seeing all those sats. No, I was not stuck in traffic. There was a technical issue because of which we were not able to get online on time. Good morning, good morning everyone, good morning. If you can just confirm, you can hear me properly, you can see me properly, we will begin the session very shortly. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All good, perfect. Thank you so much for confirming. I hope all of you are doing absolutely fine. Today's Hindu news analysis brings to you some of the most important news stories from the Hindu newspaper today. Now, before we go deeper into analyzing the Hindu newspaper, very quickly, let me also remind you that today evening, we have a very, very important workshop for all of you. Today evening at 7 p.m., we have a live workshop exclusively for all of you on the Baiju's exam prep app. Remember, this workshop will be taken by Samad sir, where he will be discussing the best strategy to prepare for Indian polity for both the prelims and the mains examination. Make sure that you do attend this workshop. This will be live at 7 p.m. on the Baiju's exam prep app, where you will have a chance to ask whatever questions that you have, especially with regards to Indian polity for prelims and the mains examination as well. Now, let's begin with the very first article that we have from today's Hindu newspaper from page number 6. The first article that we want to take up is with regards to the Ukraine-Russia war. Now, as you know, it has been almost a year since the Ukraine-Russia war began. There have been hundreds and hundreds of articles written in newspapers all around the world with regards to the Ukraine-Russia war. There have been lessons about India, about the world. There have been articles about failure of UN, so on and so forth. However, this particular article here actually talks about what lessons is it that the entire world can take from the Ukraine-Russia war. This particular article talks about how Russia did not meet its goal for the war. You would know when Vladimir Putin started the war, he thought that it will be a war for just a few days. Because if you see the size of Russia, if you see the size of Ukraine and compare both of these, anyone around the world will be able to tell you that this war was never supposed to go on for a long time. However, because of certain reasons, Russia has not been able to defeat Ukraine. In fact, on the other hand, we have a situation where Ukraine is fighting back in very, very large numbers. Now, the author here says that Vladimir Putin himself does not seem to be very sure about what he wants to do. Sometimes the Russian president says, I am ready to talk to Ukraine. On the other hand, the Russian army still keeps on attacking Ukraine. Sometimes we have news stories that is Ukraine is taking back the territory that Russia had acquired. On the other hand, Russia still is making advances in the Ukraine territory. All of these things together actually point out towards the fact that Russia is a very, very difficult country to understand. No one knows what the next Russian decision would be. No one had expected Russia to go out and attack Ukraine. And that is why we have a situation where the Ukraine-Russia war is actually still going on in the entire world. Doesn't matter the UN comes in picture, doesn't matter the Western countries or the US comes in the picture. The Ukraine-Russia war has still not been able to resolve in its entirety. Now, there are multiple lessons that this article actually tells us that the world has run. Number one, the first lesson is about the US hegemony. Now, there's a very interesting term called hegemony. Please try and understand what exactly is this. If you are a student of political science, if you have taken PSIR as your optional subject, I'm very sure you would have heard this term called hegemony. Hegemony in simple terms means political monopoly. When we have a situation where one single country can claim to be the real superpower, when one single country can claim to be the most powerful country in the world, that is called a hegemony. After the end of the Cold War, when the USSR disintegrated, there was a period of about 20-25 years where USA was the only superpower in the entire world. From the beginning of the 21st century, 
China started to challenge that. China started to come up as the next superpower. And now we see Russia also doing the same. Yes, Russia is not economically as strong as the US. However, there are certain sectors where Russia is very, very strong. Look at the defense sector. Russia has a very, very strong defense sector. Look at the energy sector where Russia again is very strong. In fact, so much so that Russia has ensured that almost entire European continent, at least the Western European part is dependent on Russia entirely when it comes to its energy supplies. All of that is because Russia has been able to establish itself as a major, major power around the world. Now, the other part of the problem that USA is facing is that right now it is a challenge that US is facing where China and Russia have come together. In fact, every few months you will see there are new stories that China and Russia have actually deepened their friendship. Just recently, China and Russia announced that their friendship is a no limit friendship, that they will help each other no matter what the situation is. In fact, there have been multiple agreements signed between the two nations in the past few years. If you look at Russia-China relationship, China has agreed to buy a lot of oil and gas from Russia. There have been multiple pipelines that have been made from Russia till China. So USA is now facing competition, not just from China, not just from Russia, but these two actually coming together, these two actually combining to now face the US. That is a problem that USA is facing right now. Now, for China also, there are many takeaways in this ongoing war. The reason why Ukraine has been able to sustain for such a long time, the reason why Ukraine has been able to ensure that they don't lose the war against Russia is because Ukraine has had the support of the Western nations. Ukraine has been held by Western nations when it comes to supply of weapons, when it comes to finances, Ukraine has made sure that they do not have or they are, they are not alone in this war going forward. There is a lesson in this for China also. As you know, China right now is in a situation that they want to go ahead and acquire Taiwan as soon as possible. We have a situation where China has made these statements time and time again that Taiwan is their integral part. However, the problem is, does China go ahead and attack Taiwan, in that case, would the Western nations, would the US actually come to save Taiwan or not? As you know, there have been multiple statements made by US as well, that if there is an attack on Taiwan, USA will come and try and save Taiwan in that case. For US also, this is a very difficult situation. US has to decide whether or not they are in support of Taiwan or not. Now, there are two things that the US is considering. In fact, there are two options that US has. One option that US has is if they allow support to Ukraine. If the US supports Ukraine, then it will send a message to China. The message will be if China tries to attack Taiwan, US will come to help Taiwan as well. On the other hand, if the US continues to support Ukraine, the other problem will be the war will only elongate. USA in the past few years, as you have seen in the past few decades, has been spending billions and trillions of dollars in just wars. Wars that have not given any significant amount of success to the US. Be it the Vietnam War, be it the Afghanistan War, US has now had a history of failing in wars and they don't want the situation to arise again. So for US also, it's a very tricky situation. Do they go ahead and help Ukraine or should they actually allow Ukraine to fend for itself? Now, the one very interesting story that we have from here is what is the relationship between Russia and China right now? As I told you, Russia and China are now closer than ever. See, Russia and China have had a very interesting history in the past. As you know, Russia and China or USSR and China, on the other hand, were the two original communist nations. See, earlier in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 
Russia and China were always close to each other because both of these are communist nations. However, both of these were not very good friends. Why? Because both these nations actually wanted to be called the leader of the communist world altogether. However, it was Russia or it was USSR at that point of time that was always considered as a bigger brother as compared to China. On the other hand, now, since the beginning of the 21st century, since the disintegration of USSR, China has now become a much, much superior country as compared to USSR. China has been in a much stronger position as compared to USSR. So that equation of big brother and younger brother between USSR and China has actually changed. China right now is behaving as an elder brother. China right now is the one that is actually helping out all the people. China is the one country that is actually helping out Russia when it comes to their fight against the Western nations. In the entire Ukraine war, China has not criticized Russia. We keep on hearing the fact that India has been buying a lot of oil and gas from Russia. But the reality is China also has been buying a lot of oil and gas from Russia. In fact, Russia opened up its doors for Chinese investments in the past few years. There was a $400 billion deal with Gazprom. Gazprom is the Russian government company, which is the exporter of gas. There was a huge deal signed with China. In fact, the trade between the two sides has also increased considerably. In 2016, the trade went up from $50 billion to $147 billion. This coming together or these, this increasing closeness between Russia and China is a direct impact of Russia actually taking over the Crimea region. The annexation of Crimea that took place was the incident that brought China and Russia closer. Because in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, that was a time when the European nations, when the US started putting their sanctions first on Russia. These are the lessons that we have to take from the Ukraine-Russia war. Again, the first lesson, the US hegemony is ending. US is now facing competition with Russia and China combining. Secondly, there is a lesson from this for China as well. Should China go ahead and acquire Taiwan or not? Because if they do, they also know that US will come and save Taiwan. Thirdly, the biggest takeaway is that Russia and China are coming very, very close together. They have announced multiple times that they have a no limits friendship right now. And their friendship will continue irrespective of no matter what. The second article that he wanted to discuss from the Hindu newspaper is written by Sri Piyush Goyal. As you know, he is a cabinet minister in the central government right now. He has written this article saying that the government of India is focusing a lot on reviving India's ancient culture. Now, this article, since it is written by the cabinet minister, it is more of information being given from the side of the government. He is telling what exactly has been the government's initiatives in the past, especially to ensure that India makes sure that our ancient culture, our ancient heritage is revived. He starts by giving an example of the recently conducted Kashi Tamil Sangamam. As you know, the Kashi Tamil Sangamam was almost a month-long program that was hosted by the central government in Varanasi. The idea was that two ancient historic civilizations, that is the Tamil civilization and the civilization of Kashi, that is Varanasi, they have a lot of things in common. They have a lot of culture, heritage in common. They should come together. So what happened was, in this entire festival organized in Varanasi, a lot of well-known people from Tamil Nadu, a lot of well-known people from different cultures were invited to be a part. A lot of saints, philosophers, thinkers were invited. And it was almost a month-long program under the Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat scheme. Now what is Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat scheme? This is a program by the government of India under which the idea is there should be pairing of states. The idea is that there should be pairing of states, meaning that let's say Punjab should be paired with Gujarat so that these two states together can organize events, these two can have exchange of cultures, these two can have exchange of languages and the people can learn from each other. Similarly, let's assume that Himachal Pradesh is paired with Karnataka. Let's say West Bengal is paired with Maharashtra. So there should be pairing of states and the two states should come together 
to propagate their culture, their language, their heritage, so that the people can come closer and they can actually have a much more united feeling. Under this project only, Varanasi, that is Uttar Pradesh and Tamil Nadu were clubbed together under the Ek Bharat Shresh Bharat program. The author here says that the government of India has focused a lot on development of cultural heritage in the past few years. If you are aware of this, you would know that the government of India has already inaugurated the Kashi Vishwanath corridor. That's, that's a corridor that connects the famous Kashi Vishwanath temple to the banks of the Ganga river. It connects the Jyote Ling with the Ganga river and it has made sure that the thousands and lakhs of people who visit the Kashi Vishwanath temple every single day can actually visit very, very easily, go up till the banks of the Ganga river which is now connected internally from the temple complex itself. Varanasi and Tamil culture also have a lot of other things in common. Both the things are well known for their silk sarees, both the things are well known for different types, both the places are well known for different types of textile, for different types of heritage and culture as well. The government of India has been working to revive that as well. The government of India has ensured that entrepreneurs, weavers from both the regions actually are given state-of-the-art training so that their skill development can take place, their marketing, their quality control, their machinery becomes better so that they are able to sell their products in the market. This article mainly focuses on the government's efforts towards the textile sector specifically. The author here says that India's textile market has a lot of potential in the near future. India's textile market is expected <clears throat> to reach $2 trillion by 2047. In fact, as per the author, the government is promoting one district, one product scheme. So under this, government of India has actually given a target to every district that, <clears throat> sorry, whatever famous product you have from your district, let's identify that. Let's make it a world-class product so that the people can actually market this product and that can become the USP of the district. The government wants to have one product from each district across the country. The traditional workers in that field of product will be given training from the side of the government of India as well. In fact, to compete with Amazon, Flipkart, all of the e-commerce platforms, the government has also launched its own O. Open Network for Digital Commerce, ONDC. As you know, this ONDC, that is the Open Network for Digital Commerce, is will be a kind of an e-commerce platform where all these traditional handicraft workers, etc. will be invited to sell their products without any bias from these companies such as Amazon, Flipkart, etc. I also wanted to share with you some of the other efforts by the government of India to promote textiles in the country. For example, the government of India just a few months back had introduced a national technical textiles mission. This was approved by the government of India in 2020 to position India as a global leader in technical textile. As you know, India wants to become a hub of merchandise of textile. For that, the government of India wants to give a push to this sector. It can lead to a lot of job generation. The other good part about this sector, about the technical textile sector is that it does not necessarily have to be in the urban areas. This is not power intensive, this is labor intensive business. So any area, even the rural areas that have a large population, where we have enough people who are willing to work in this sector, they can easily work in this sector and they can easily contribute to the textile and merchandise sector in the government's eyes. This particular mission would have four components. First, there will be focus on research, development and innovation. Second component will be promotion and development of market for te technical textiles. Third component will be promotion of exports. And fourth component will be focusing on training, education and skill development as well. All these things together will make up the National Technical Textile Mission announced by the Government of India. The next article from today's newspaper is with regards to Election Commission of India. What has happened is recently the, government, the Election Commission of India announced that they will very soon allow remote voting as well. Now what is remote voting? 
See, as you know, there is a lot of migration of people within the country and outside India as well. A lot of people go from India to other countries to work, for job, etc., to study. But even within the country, there are a lot of domestic workers. You might not be living in the city from where your voter ID card is. You would go to college, you would go for a job in some other city and you would not be able to vote in the new city because your voter ID card is of some other city. Because of which the voting percentage in India is not very high. So the election commission of India has thought of a solution. The election commission of India has thought that they will now allow remote voting as well. Meaning that the election commission of India is saying that even if let's say you are in Mumbai, but your voter ID card is from other city, let's say Lucknow. Even being in Mumbai, you will be able to vote in the elections in Lucknow. You would not have to go back. For this, they have launched a new machine called Remote Voting Machine, RVM. <clears throat> Remote Voting Machine. This will be shown to all the political parties on 16th of January so that all of them can be taken into confidence. Now, the theme of this article is, as per the author, this is not a very good idea. Because the author says that wherever across the world, this kind of a project is taken up, this has not become a success. There are a lot of problems with remote voting facility. For example, the author says, number one, how will the election commission ensure that everyone is able to apply and register for remote voting very, very easily? Second problem is, how will we make sure there is no duplication? What if someone is voting in their local city where they are living also and they are voting in some other place also? How will that be ascertained? There is a challenge in that also. Third biggest challenge, how will the votes be counted? See, let's say there are 10,000 people who have a voter ID card of let's say Lucknow, but they are living all across the country. Individually, how will you allow all of them to vote? That will not be a very easy process. Also, how will you count their votes? It is very easy to say that we will be able to do that, but it's very, very difficult to implement. Yes, the Election Commission of India is going ahead and they're releasing a new machine for that, the remote voting machine. But the author says introducing a machine is not really the part of the problem. It's a, the easiest thing to do. The part of the problem will be solving these kind of things. How will we ensure that everyone is voting properly? How will we ensure that there is voting booth at every in every part of the country for any of the constituencies? It will not be that easy. How will we make sure that one person's name is only on one voter list and not multiple voter lists? How will you have polling agents at all the polling booths? Right now, you know that if, let's say, a person is contesting election from Lucknow, then his or her agents are in Lucknow making sure that voting is going on fine. But when you know that voting can take place in any part of the country, how will you actually send all your election agents to different booths? These are parts of the problem. The author here is saying that multiple nations have tried this in the past, but they have not been successful. He is giving example of Germany. He is giving example of other countries in Europe, in USA also, where these kind of things have not been successful in the past. In fact, in India also, you know, multiple questions have been raised on EVM machines. Many political parties have said that EVM machines are not trustworthy. However, the Supreme Court has suggested to the government that it is compulsory to have VV pads. Remember VV pads, voter verifiable paper audit trail. Meaning that there is a small printer kind of a machine that is attached with the EVM. If you press the button on the EVM, let's say you vote for a particular party. There will be a printout slip that will come out of the VV pad and you can verify if the correct party was voted for. This is called the VV pad. It is used to verify this. Now the interesting part is as per the author, although the Supreme Court said that VV pads should be used and VV pads should be used to verify the elections, but even today, VV pads are not really used, they are not counted. So even the validity of the current elections is in question, as per the author. The author is saying that without the VV pads, 
we are still continuing the election despite the Supreme Court saying that VV pads should be used and they should be validated, the vote should be counted on VV pad also, even that is not done. So rather than focusing on that, we should not focus on remote voting right now. As per the author, India is still not ready for this. Now the argument for remote voting is a very old argument. Please do understand remote voting is of two types. One, when you talk about NRIs, people who are outside the country, people who are, let's say, working or getting education in US, Europe, etc. Do they have the right to vote in India? Yes, they have the right to vote, but they have to come back to India to vote. They are not allowed to vote sitting in US, etc. They can come back and they can vote if they are Indian citizens. However, the criticism is that we focus more on the NRIs, but we don't focus more on the domestic workers, the domestic migrant laborers, the domestic college students that shifted from one city to the other city. So government of India and the election commission is focusing on that. Why? Number one, as I told you, the voter turnout in usual elections in India is very, very low. Because of which the election commission thinks that having more people or having allowing more people to vote remotely would actually increase the chances of more people coming out to vote. There are certain villages, for example, in India and Uttarakhand, where only 20 to 25 percent people come out to vote. Why? Because most of them go out of their village, go out of their city to find jobs. Second, there are concerns about metro areas, especially. There are metro areas where the voting station, the polling booth is not very near to your house. Many people don't go out to vote thinking they have to go very far off, they have to travel very far off just to go and vote. That is why the voting percentage also comes down. Then there are also issues about unorganized workers, health concerns, etc. Health concerns mean there are many people who would not be able to go out and vote. Maybe they are physically ill. Maybe they don't have the resources, maybe there are old people who don't have anyone to take them to go to the uh, polling booth. All of these concerns can be addressed through remote voting. This is the idea behind the Election Commission of India going ahead with this particular idea. The next article is a very interesting problem that is still unresolved between the states of Telangana and Arunachal Pradesh. As you know, Telangana came into being in 2014 when the earlier state of Andhra Pradesh was divided into two parts. Now, whenever you have a new state that is formed, one big problem is how do you divide the assets and liabilities? For example, let's say the earlier state of Andhra Pradesh before 2014, all the property that the government had, all the money that the government had, how do you divide that? What about their loans? What about the different types of things that will actually be in the earlier state of Andhra Pradesh, how will you divide all of that? That is a problem that has still not been resolved. Now, in case of Andhra Pradesh, let's try and understand what the issue was. In 2014, Telangana was formed. The idea was for 10 years, the idea was for 10 years, Hyderabad will be the combined capital. For 10 years, Hyderabad will be the combined capital for both. So 10 years will complete in 2024. After this, Hyderabad will be the capital of Telangana, while Andhra Pradesh will have a new capital. They are still deciding one capital or three capitals, but let's keep that aside. Now, the problem is, so far, the division between the two has still not taken place properly. I'll give you an example. Let's assume that Andhra Pradesh state had about 100 government organization, 100 government offices, okay? Now, when Telangana is created separately, Andhra Pradesh is separate, how do you divide these offices, their land, their property, the money that they have, how do you divide all of that? That is still a problem that has not been resolved so far. Now, the Andhra Pradesh Reorganization Act of 2014, that was a law under which Andhra Pradesh was divided. That law told about how the different areas will be divided between the two states. However, there was still no clarity on certain organizations. There were about 12 organizations that were not mentioned in the act about how they will be divided. Now, let me tell you what the problem is. 
there are two ways in which you can divide the organizations. One way is how, what Telangana wants. They are saying every organization should be divided on the basis of their headquarter. Let's try and understand this. If let's say there is an organization in the state of Andhra Pradesh that has its headquarters in Hyderabad, then that organization and its land should go to Telangana. Why? Because Hyderabad will be the capital of Telangana only. Andhra Pradesh on the other hand says that this is not right. Why? Andhra Pradesh says that since Hyderabad was the capital, most of the headquarters of the offices are in Hyderabad only. So if you divide our territory or if you divide the offices on the basis of headquarter location, then this is unfair to us. Andhra Pradesh has been demanding a fair division of property, a fair division of assets, a fair division of liability between the two states. Telangana on the other hand does not really seem to agree with this. Telangana is saying that whatever is headquartered in Hyderabad should go to us, should come to us. Andhra Pradesh is saying that should not be the case. We have a higher population that te than Telangana. We need more resources. We need more property and that is what should happen. 10 years are now about to complete. After these 10 years, as I told you, Hyderabad will become the capital of Telangana only, while Andhra Pradesh will have a new capital. But the situation has still not been resolved. Now what has happened? Why is it in the news again? Andhra Pradesh has gone to the Supreme Court of India. The state of Andhra Pradesh through their chief secretary has appealed in the Supreme Court saying that we now want proper distribution of assets and liabilities with Telangana. For example, one property which is under dispute is the Andhra Pradesh Bhavan. Andhra Pradesh Bhavan in Delhi. Now, if you live in Delhi or if you have been to Delhi, you will notice in Delhi, most of the Indian states have one of their houses or it's a very big office. We have Maharashtra Bhavan, we have, let's say, Gujarat Bhavan, we have Bihar Sadhan. All these kind of state governments have one or two properties in Delhi. So, for example, if someone from Bihar government goes to Delhi, they will usually stay in Bihar Bhavan. You, similarly, when someone from the state of Andhra Pradesh, any bureaucrat, will go to Delhi, they will stay in the Andhra Pradesh Bhavan. These are huge properties. For example, Andhra Pradesh Bhavan in Delhi is almost close to 20 acres. Now, how will that be divided? That has still not been clear. Because see, when you have 20 acres of land in the prime location of Delhi, it is worth a lot of money. As per the experts, the Andhra Pradesh Bhavan's value will be over 7,000 crore rupees. How will that be divided between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana? That is still not clear. Andhra Pradesh has suggested certain formulas, but Telangana has not accepted that. Because of which Andhra Pradesh now has moved to Supreme Court, saying that we want to settle these disputes as soon as possible. As you know, disputes between states are a part of original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of India. Do remember that. This is why it is the Supreme Court of India which has the right to resolve these kind of issues between the two states. The next article that we have here is actually an older article of Hindu newspaper that is published again today. The Hindu newspaper does it very, very often. Hindu newspaper usually they bring back their articles of one, two years old and they bring them back because the issue has become relevant again. This article of the Hindu newspaper was first published in June 2021 and it has come back again. Now what is the issue? As you would know a few years back, Tamil Nadu government announced that from now onwards, Tamil Nadu government will not use the word central government. Tamil Nadu said that central government is not an official phrase. In place of this, we will use union government. Tamil Nadu government said that central government is not the correct usage. We will use the word union government. Now, why? See, if you look at the constitution of India, the constitution of India 
does not mention the word central government anywhere. The Constitution of India only mentions the word union government and not central government. There is no definition of central government in the Constitution of India. Even then the word central government is used. Central government was defined in 1897 by the British where central government meant the president of India. But in our constitution right now the central government word has not been defined anywhere in the entire constitution. Now Tamil Nadu government says the reason why we are doing this is because central government, the word central government usually means a government at the central level which has all the powers. On the other hand, union government means a government at the central level which is collaborating with the entire country. So Tamil Nadu says that central government word is not to be used because it actually gives an indication that the central government is very very powerful. Now if you look at the constituent assembly, how the constitution of India was made, you also know in the constituent assembly of India there was a big debate about what should be the words used to define the government of India. For example, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was very clear that we should use the word union of states <clears throat> and not federation of states. As you know in the constitution of India in article 1, the very first article of the constitution says India shall be a union of states. Union of states means that the states are destructible but the entire country is indestructible meaning that no state government can say that we are leaving the country. India as a whole will be an indestructible country that is why the word union was used. Yes the word union tells that we have a much stronger government as compared to the state government but at the same time, the state governments also are given certain independence. As you know, in the seventh schedule of the constitution, we have a separate state list. States have a lot of power to make laws on their own kind of subjects. Police, law and order, all these things are a part of the state government's list and the state governments are free to make their laws on that. Tamil Nadu government, the, the decision that they took of using the word union government instead of central government is now being appreciated by many people. Many people are saying that the Tamil Nadu government by using the word union government is actually going back to the constitution which is good because the word central government was anywhere, nowhere mentioned in the entire constitution. As you know India is a federal country. In other words India can be defined as a quasi-federal country. Meaning that Although India is federal in nature, meaning that we have divided powers between the center and the state, but the state governments still have a lot of independence. Yes, the center government is more powerful, but the state governments also do have a lot of power. As I told you, the state governments have their own state list. The state governments have their own kind of laws. We have the police, land, law and order, all of that is under the state governments. The state governments are allowed to make their own rules and regulations on all the subjects that are in the state list. They have their own bureaucracy. That is why the state governments also have the right to act as independent units. The state governments should not be controlled by the center government. That is why using the word union government is much, much more significant it is in line with the constitution rather than using the word central government. So ideally the word union government only should be used. These are the important articles on the Hindu newspaper today. A couple of practice questions for all of you from these articles. First, despite establishing a quasi-federal nation, the constituent assembly envisage a strong and independent state governments. Give examples in support of this argument. This is what we were discussing right now. Second, Pending issues between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana point out towards an urgent need to revive zonal council and interstate council in the country elaborate. As all of you know, as soon as this session 
is over you will have a quiz on our telegram channel based on the topics that were discussed today make sure that you do attend that quiz if you have still not subscribed to our channel make sure that you do hit the subscribe button and also share these videos with your friends as well i'll quickly take up a question that i see in the chat there's a question that i have what is quasi judicial so see the word quasi usually means half quasi judicial means a body which has certain powers similar to the judiciary so they can also investigate certain matters they can also see if some person is right or wrong quasi means that it is not completely judicial it is half judicial it has some powers of the judiciary perfect thank you so much for coming up for the session we'll see you tomorrow same time 10 am make sure that you do attend the live workshop today evening at 7 pm on the baidu's exam prep app thank you so much jai hind